Today we have Thomas Ubel with us here today from the University of Manchester. He has recently, well, how recently is, is the book from? Is it from 2000 and... I, I never know whether it's either 2004 or 2005, thereabouts. So it's right. nearly nearly 20 years old. Right. And it's a, it's a book called The Selected Economic Writings of Otto Neurath from 1904 to 1945. Thomas, how did you end up writing and getting involved with, with this book? Well, as uh, your listeners may probably realise uh, fairly soon, I'm not an economist by trade, but rather I, you know, my field is philosophy, and there I specialize in epistemology and philosophy of science. And it's in that field that I first first met Neurath. Uh, Neurath was a member of the Vienna Circle. It is one of the origins of logical empiricism, also known as logical positivism. And as you may know, this is not a very popular kind of philosophy these days, uh, especially on the left. But strangely enough, and I grew very much, very much grew up with that conception. Like, you know, I read my Marcuse when I was 18, and I knew, etc, etc, etc. But what I found in my research was that uh, Neurath's own philosophical views are actually squarely contradicted or squarely contradict the objectionable positivist doctrines that are typically ascribed to him as a member of the Vienna Circle. So we have a kind of a look here, you know, this guy is totally different, what's going on here. And needless to say, that provided a lot of, lot of material. And then it happened that Bob Cohen, who, who also edited uh, two volumes of Neurath's philosophical papers with Marie Neurath, uh, Neurath's widow, who then had deceased. Uh, he, when, when Bob Cohen asked me to co-edit a volume of selections from Neurath's editor, uh, economic writings, uh, I I happily agreed, expecting once more to find the real Neura to be somewhat different from the one that legend tells us he is. And uh, I must say I was not disappointed, just as he was no dumb positivist in philosophy. He is not quite the romantic fool in economics that he's often characterized as, which is not to say that he's got everything right, but uh, in any case, it wasn't easy to find out what what he's actually how 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 to characterize them uh, as you may have noted in this long introduction in the book i tried to place his work in the field in economics in context and so that was first his his work in economic history then his work in in war economics a discipline which he claimed he actually invented then his socialization proposals and later his work on social indicators etc cetera, etc cetera. And anyway, in, in, in the course of that, I found it very diff difficult to assign him squarely to one school. Quite obviously, he was not, a, not, a, not, a, not an orthodox Marxist, and, but even amongst the Austro-Marxists, he egged all sorts of people on rather oddly, so he was really unsyncratic. But uh, so I sort of, you know, couldn't help but just sort of leave him hanging there. In, this, in the meantime, I've come to think that perhaps Neurad may be best viewed as belonging to this itself undefined stream of institutional economics. He himself often pointed out that what he's interested in is to investigate how different organizational forms of the economy, different institutional setups, influence the material well-being of populations. You know what kind of exchange relations are instituted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and and for that kind of inquiry, he used whatever tools he found useful, and unsurprisingly, he found a lot of useful tools in Marxism as well. So, Neurath. So, what I found then is that that Neurath's proposal, ultimately, then for the socialization of an in, in economy reflects a somewhat undogmatic, or some people might say eclectic, kind of approach. But at the same time, it was a, it is of, well, first of all, striking radicality, but it's not just radical in the sense of mad, it's also original in the sense of conceptually really interesting and quite, quite penetrating in some sense, right? So, in short, 
what what distinguishes perhaps his approach to this whole socialization reorganization of economy matter is not a, that he gave expression not only to the idea that was expressed before him now we're talking about 1918 19 obviously that capitalist economies have to be replaced wholesale by centralized planned economies but that nobody had actually worked through that even kautsky was very much hand waving and from what i understand about the bolshevik war economics it was it was not very systematic either before they then went backwards again to nep and that kind of stuff anyway so so it's not that but what norad also also stressed that that this socialization business went meant more than simply changing social uh, social relations and the ownership relations of the means of production it also required the development of entirely new conceptual tools in order to manage an economy by means of plans and well with that he may have raised more questions than he could himself answer but even so he you know he 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 directs us i think or directed us to pretty interesting issues that's that's how i got how i got into the box so to speak <laughs> yeah because it's it's a eclectic is probably a very good term to it i i find it sometimes i would nearly go so far as to say like quixotic in describing <laughs> how he puts together the different ideas and maybe sometimes his interpretation of of different texts as well so you know i i consider myself a marxist i read capital and all that good stuff and when i approached reading your your selection here of his of his economic books i was quite surprised in uh, the approach overwhelmingly i would think is probably a fair point to say that he comes from a kind of a subjectivist notion of value so he comes out of i think he was taught by the critics of marx borkovich and von bohm i i've recently read some of of hilferding who was like around at the time and had some similar ideas to Neurath but from a very much a value theory Marxist value theory point mm-hmm. of view. Do you want to talk about maybe Neurath's subjective theories and how they influenced his thought? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Uh well this takes us right to the middle of things. Uh I mean you're absolutely right Neurath uh, if 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 you look for the labor theory of value in Neurath you won't find it. and it's certainly true that in an in an early textbook on economics which he wrote in 1910 or something he actually accepted the subjective conception of value very much very much like karl menger etc kind of stuff but that said i i'm i'm not sure at all whether theories of value play a significant role in his planning theory as strange as it sounds certainly the originality of neurath's conceptions is missed if he's put either in the subjectivist or the objectivist bag so to start with neurath didn't also just reject the labor theory of value as an objective theory he also he also objective utilitarianism as a as as a basis for a socio-economic ordering of society there's a paper of 1912 on on pleasure maxima where he points out that well without without a so-called dictator or arbiter there's no way to rank or order the different conceptions of the good and take account of them in the case of determining the pleasure maximum of a collective which is what you would have to do there unlike when you talk about a pleasure maximum of an individual so for norad from that he derived the fact that okay so i suppose social theory has to work without an objective measure of value altogether but as far as i understand him that doesn't really make make him uh, make him use subjective utility as a value basis for his theory as you would as 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 certainly not as do neoclassical economists or or other austrian economists so the first point to make there is that when neurath developed his ideas sort of 17 18 19 there there about that was of course long before the ideas for so called market socialism were 
developed, which have dominated the socialist calculation dispute uh, debate in the Anglophone world since, well, the late 20s, certainly since the 30s, right? For Neurath, what did he mean by socialism? He simply meant the running of an economy by the people for the people, as he expressed it repeatedly when he put his proposals before the meetings of worker councils in Munich and Chemnitz and various, various places, right? So his conception of the economics of socialism required a, uh, not only this radical change of social relations, but also a changed conceptual framework. And moreover, as Norad would put it, socialism did not simply mean an improved version of capitalism, and that's where it becomes slightly polemical. So he would say, I don't mean state capitalism, but I don't mean worker cooperatives capitalism either, right? But it's the wholesale replacement. So that meant for him, socialism has to do without a market altogether. It meant an, an economy organized according to a comprehensive plan for the production and consumption that's guided by the consideration of social need satisfaction. So in place of a market with money prices for goods and services of all types, which is determined by supply and demand, etc. In other words, a market that was free to disregard the needs of those who are unable to participate in it. Instead of that, Neurath envisaged, well, what we do is we develop a comprehensive economic plan that is oriented towards what the population needs. And what the population needs is, first of all, well, stuff that helps material welfare. So it's food, it's housing, it's clothing, it's health provision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's with these things that, that immediately that the notions of economy in kind and calculation in kind come into view. Well, I'll, I'll go into them maybe, maybe in a moment. But perhaps before that, a couple of points to mention in, 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 in light of your question about Norad's value theory is uh, maybe a slightly crass point to make Neurath's perspective, you know, intelligible, is that he wanted use value to trump exchange value as a decisive criterion for economic decisions. So, so insofar as both the labor theory of value or, on the other side, subjectivist theories can be seen as seeking to provide foundations for determining the exchange value of goods. Well, I think this helps to, this orientation towards use value helps to, dis, helps to interest Neurath's, helps, helps to explain Neurath's disinterest in these things, perhaps. And needless to say, the, this, this also explains his unorthodox uphill struggle, because for many people, Economists, especially, use value has no room in economy, in economics anymore. That's for kids. That's you know, that's for the household, but not. You know, that's not how markets work, right? So, what Neurath's planning then starts from is the need to provide certain minima of provision of food, housing, clothing, health, education, even entertainment. He points out he doesn't doesn't forget that. And that may look like, on first look, like what's often called an objective list of needs, right? Instead of just preference satisfaction, so you go for objective list satisfaction. But I'm not quite sure whether that could be dressed up as for Neurath as a theory of value. In, in, he has a, certainly a conception of value that that he he wishes economics to to explore. But there, there he's there he's very much an Aristotelian for whom economics was a science of wealth, which he understood as real income, material provision. Right. It's more so, of a kind of a it's more of a physicalist approach. Yeah, in a way, yes. One would have to be explain what one means by physicalist here, but yeah, right. yeah, 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 it is, yes, exactly. Right. But at the same time, so it's so in a sense, Nora is very, very much away from the beaten paths, a sort of sort of mainstream of economic thinking. Yet at the same time, he saw himself at one with his concern with 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 material and material provision, real income and, and stuff, 
These homes have had one with the classical economics and with certain bits of Marx and Engels. I mean, he spent a, a considerable part of a book in 1925 where he tried to convince readers that his conception of socialization fits perfectly with Marx. Needless to say, uh, there were some comrades who disagreed with him. But, <laughs> and he had debates with the wife of Otto Bauer and you know, it, it, interesting debates in the uh, journal of the uh, Austrian, Austrian socialists and stuff. But, you know, also one might say that with this concern for the provision of social minima, he also made cause long before his time with what later pioneers of ecological economics were concerned with, like like William Capp, for example. So that's, that's as it were, one thing on NORAD and value. A point on planning, perhaps, briefly, uh, first, is that when NORAD talks about making economic plans, he's always concerned to underline the plural S at the end, plans. Right. For Neurad, economic planning is, is first of all indicative. It, it aims to show, or certainly in the first step, it aims to show or, or should show what's possible to produce with the given resources at hand. And therefore, he thought, well, obviously, there's many possibilities for using the resources at hand. So what, what has to be done if one, ha- if one thinks of this planning an economy properly, well, one has to do, one has to run a number of plans, a number of different plans that show what what the alternative usages uh, of the resources are, et cetera, et cetera. And moreover, different plans have to be developed more or less at the, as Nora had headed at the same time. And they were then, as it were, given as he put it in in some places, to the populace or its representatives to decide upon, well, which one do you want? So it wasn't up to the planners to say, this is the economy we want to have, running an economy by the people for the people. So he probably wouldn't have fancied the idea of a vanguard party either. But (laughs) Can I uh, ask a question here about the nature of these plans? Because like in for some socialists, this plan is a... a massive list of instructions for every member of society to perform. On what level were these plans? What is the detail level of these options of plans that Neurath envisaged? Well, that's that's a very good question. I think he 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 started, so to speak, with a big picture. And again, this is maybe a point I can come back to back to later. We're talking about 1918, 1919, right after the collapse of the German and Austrian economies and uh, after the, you know, lost war and everything was down and, you know, a great material need of the population. So there were some pressing needs, which you say, well, how do we, how, how can we do that? And he started with that and then would say working, working from that. Uh, would then issue, issue, I suppose, plans for the individual branches of the economy, the individual sectors, and how far it goes to telling individual enterprises what to do, that he left open. I mean, there's an interesting anecdote from his involvement in the Bavarian Revolution. As you know, Gustav Landauer was was involved in that, and he was a kind of a libertarian, kind of anarchist, libertarian, socialist kind of stuff. Who who played a who played a, then a prominent role, I think, in the in the Soviet phase of the Bavarian Republic, but um, he he wanted uh, he was arguing for a while for having a a, a commune organization of uh, people sort of in the, and Neurath argued, well, why not? Let's find let's find a place for them. They can run a commune. We tell them what to produce. But how they're going to run it, how they in, how they organize themselves within their productive unit, why not? So he stressed, in fact, in, 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 in one of his papers on, it's frighteningly called total socialization, given the associations we have with total, it's frightening that German actually is Vollsozialisierung, which, is, which in German actually sounds far more healthy because it's the same as Vollkorn Brot, you know, the, the bread that is really healthy kind of stuff. 
where he kind of said that, in fact, um, for Neurad, socialism was to ideally give a framework that allowed different ways of local organization. He was a strict disciplinarian, I suppose, when it came to delivering the plans all the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the produce that the plan required, but how we, how, how people could get there and stuff. He, does that, does that answer? Yeah, it's quite hand wavy because he, he, he gets it. Yeah. I suppose it is hand wavy, but you know, he, he does not, his writings do not quite go down to that level. In places, That's though, I would say that they kind of do veer into this. You see, this is why I found reading. The, I had to read the book twice. And after I read the book the first time, I read your I read your introduction after reading the book. Uh -huh. And then I read it the second time. And I found that there are places where he talks about, you know, give, I don't know if this is the right place to, to, to bring this in yet, but where he gives kind of numerical examples about how to choose between plans even though he kind of rejects this notion of using utility to 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 generate a plan he then kind of says well maybe we could use it to decide between plans and he 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 nearly gives examples of you know this this economic plan has so much high intense worker high intensity of work right, yeah. and, and this number of workers and uh, thus we can choose this one over the other one because this has a lower point tally that we we come up with some some way of making these incommensurable items have a single kind of point estimator, like a, a one point score that might be made up of a little bit of work intensity, a little bit of labor hours, a little bit of yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And so like that, that actual way of thinking about the economic, economic plans also seems to lend itself to being applied at any kind of lower scales. So it, it, it becomes kind of unclear when you're reading whether he is saying we should be applying that to all levels of the economic plan. Is that a, like, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Sort of. I'm not totally sure. I mean, me... what, I, I, I don't I mean, one 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 point that I'll probably be stressing in a moment is that that Nora <laughs> would say that we definitely have to, for better or worse, have to give up this choice, this search for a commensurating unit right rather what we do what we do is when we choose between plans we 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 have no algorithm there rather what we have to we have to pass a judgment we can see that one plan is good in that way but worse in that way another one is that but how do how do we account for that well luckily i mean he he has a way out he says well it's not i as a planner that's not my job it's those people who decide which of the plans to choose, they have to make the decision. And I suppose if he once he posited, once he put get takes these overall plans, puts these overall plans to the to the vote, so to speak, of of some kind of people's representatives. It's again, these wouldn't be economists, which come with a with a certain algorithm, but they say, well, what do we want? Do we want slightly more luxury and less health provision or do, do we want to be safer with regard to health provision and have less luxury and that kind of stuff he, he still does he, he does propose a, a, like a kind of a way of tallying the difference between two plans where he he says maybe this plan has maybe a b c d and e and we can associate uh points to each of these criteria am i right in saying this I think you're wrong, actually. I don't. I haven't. Uh... So I, I'm looking at around page, I think, 434. It's in chapter 13, and he has some tables where he gives an example of economic plan one and economic plan two. Yes, but but note, yes, economic plan, economic two. But but look, this is all. This is there, there's no commensurating unit there. Okay. Yes. No. So. Let me say the question more clearly because uh, I wasn't very clear. Okay. Neurat does propose a way to choose between plans. So we have this difficulty of choosing between things that are incommensurable. Like you said earlier, do we want so much luxury and less work or slightly more luxury and yeah, yeah. more healthcare and more sports facilities or, or whatever? And that these are incommensurable. It's an apples and oranges problem. 
But to choose between certain plans, he does build up a way of giving points that are scored between these different things. Okay. Yeah. So that you end up with a single point estimator. So, so for example, right. you end up with a number like this plan is 7,248,000, whatever we want to call these points. And this plan is only, we estimate 6.8 million. So we should go for plan one over plan two because we think that it has in some way for society more utility however we want to to judge what that is so he seems yeah. to dance this line between saying incommensurable but then wants us to come up with a single estimator such that we can judge between these multi-dimensional plans okay but uh Note note that what he's what he says about this these points assignments. He says that certain conventions can be introduced for purpose of the distribution. So there is nothing, so to speak, natural or let alone essential as to what weighting something any 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 particular any particular thing might have. So the point system itself is up for grabs. Right. So it doesn't provide, so to speak, a foundation on which to say, oh, well, we make our plans and then we go to go to our point system and we see, no, well, um, how how you assign points is, 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 so to speak, subjective in the pot. Well, it's in the pot to be decided by the people who decide about the plans. Yeah, no, this is it, it's pretty. <laughs> uh, can I bring in? As a as an, a philosophical point, if if I dare say, or a point from Neurath when he wore his philosopher's head with regard to the theory of knowledge and you know scientific knowledge and kind of stuff, he came up with a with a metaphor that later on Quine picked up and went with and kind of stuff. Namely, this metaphor of the of the boat. He says we are like sailor with regard our knowledge is a, with regard to knowledge. We're a bit like sailors who have to repair their ship. While they're still at sea, out on the ocean, without being able to pull into dry dock and repair it there out of best material. So, in other words, our boat is leaking, but we have to fix it up out of out on the sea. But we don't have a have a safe foundation on which to build. So everything is in flux somewhat, and we'll have to find provisional ways to make sense of things build on those see how far we get maybe come back and revise them or find they work with and and go on so yes obviously he has to find a way of deciding between plans but yeah but that's as i said these these decision points are themselves to be decided right so let me ask a question related to that then so it's hard to ask this question without his first detailing perhaps the socialist calculation debate. So maybe we should head into the socialist calculation debate before. Do you think this is a good place to head into it? Or we could say look at look into calculation in kind just a little yes, bit. Yes, let's more. do that first. Okay, well the the calculation in kind these these are the central things as I noted tried to note earlier. Um Given that he's interested in use value, we, he wants to bring use value back into the into the purview of, of of socialist economics. He has this notion of calculation in kind, naturalrechnung, and economy in kind. So, what that means, a uh, calculation in kind means that an economic plan is devised in natura, so in quantities of different stuff or quantity or, or, or of services or corn, coal, hospitals, what have you kind of stuff that are to be produced or consumed or used in further production kind of stuff. And economy in kind, natural Wirtschaft, means that an economy is run, that economic decisions are taken in light of the material benefit derived from these ultimately ultimately uh, goods that are produced so it's not as it were for profit or that kind of stuff right so why does he hit upon that well he hits upon that on the one hand obviously he's concerned with use value but also he wants he's trying to he's trying to 
given that he's concerned with social minima and need satisfaction, he's trying to find a way that remains true to how we actually do think of these basic needs and kind of things, and namely that they're not subst substitutable for each other, right? So with the notion of calculation in kind, he tries to come up with a way of, or, or tries to develop a tool for economic decision-making that avoids the assumption of universal intersubstitutivity that I nearly said traditional, certainly neoclassical, and you know, the, the quote unquote normal sort of economics works with. And because he thinks, well, actually, this idea of universal intersubstitutivity simply fails. It's, we might say, well, it's an idealization that's needed in order to get our mathematics to be working. Well, that may, may certainly be true. But he says that, nevertheless, it, 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 misses, it misses something important about the object which we are trying to be concerned with. And if we're concerned with prices and the market, maybe that's okay. But if we're concerned with social need satisfaction, direct social need satisfaction, then this failure of, of universal intersubstitutivity is not simply to be taken lightly and considered a mere, a mere kind of idealization. So what, what Neurath does there then is tries to take seriously this, you mentioned it, it before, this notion of incommensurability, the notion of incommensurability between values and which he understands, how does he, as different notions of how do we understand incommensurability? Well, we could say value incommensurability, we could understand that as denying both cardinal and ordinal comparability, right? So, if, no go if two goods are comparable neither by a cardinal nor an ordinal measure, then, well, it follows that there's no criteria available in the light of which they could be substituted for each other. Can you explain just for the listener what, what cardinal and ordinal are? Yeah, well, sure. Um, well, cardinal is if you have a concrete quantity like, you know, 20 units of this versus 18 units or that or the kind of stuff. Whereas if it's an ordinal measure, you can just rank things as higher or lower. So uh, first, one thing is more important than another or less important kind of stuff. But it doesn't say anything about the scale it doesn't them. say anything about the scale, okay. no. Whereas, whereas a cardinal measures give you scales, and you can read all sorts of all sorts of other other relations between the two quantities and questions from that. Yes, quite right. So it's 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 really with this with this recognition of incommensurability that Neurath challenges, particularly the well, the traditional economics as we know it and kind of this is one of the aspects where he sort of said well look socialism as he understands it norad requires different requires different tools right now if calculation in kind does that and therefore you know deals only with you know stuff in their natural kinds what it requires is obviously what Norad called universal statistics, and that is a comprehensive inventory of natural and labor resources, of available technologies and all these technical coefficients state for what goes with what, and then, you know, exhaustive statistics for input-output analyses of work processes stuff. It's once, and, and Norad makes it clear that this is, so to speak, a somewhat problematic point of his proposals, because he admits that, as a matter of fact, so far, we don't have that statistics yet. But he says, let's, let's start working on it. You know, even if we can't socialize it yet, we can certainly work on finding anyway. So his, his, his economic plans presupposes that we have such a such a pretty comprehensive inventory of resources, work techniques, etc. Once we have that, however, Norab Fields calculation in kind needs no commensurating units. We can we can stay in no it doesn't mean and he's quite radical. He says it doesn't mean need money, it doesn't need labor time, it doesn't need psychic units of utility, none of this. We stick with with our things. 
And instead, the quote unquote utility of a plan is to be assessed directly in, well, what does it do for you? What does it do for us? Is it health? Is it etc.? So it follows then also that if one says, okay, if one places places Neurath's planning conception in a, as it were, framework of democratic socialism, it also not only does it require as formally as a presupposition this universal statistics, this uh, you know comprehensive inventory. On the other hand, it also requires Neurath. Unfortunately, well, that's not where his, so to speak, expertise lay. But it's quite clear that his model also requires what something like uh, models of deliberation of public deliberation, namely about when it gets to making decisions about which plans to implement. Because, you know, well, do you just slam them on the table and <laughs> and all the representatives and the People's Congress to say, well, which one do you want? Or, you know, they, you probably have to explain them at first a little bit and then say, you know, pros and cons. And then the people or their 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 representatives themselves may want to discuss between them because it's not obvious how to work. So there are, uh, in in a sense, the Neuratian concept. Even the Neurat himself thought of himself and and presented only one aspect of this conception, namely the what he called the social engineering conception. You know, there's a there's a certain lacuna that has to be filled that deals with a political framework which is required in order to make such a conception of planning to work, in order to get it to work. Right. He seems to not really go into that in any great detail in these writings. No, he doesn't. In fact, he generally he generally stays away from that. For what one can only guess why, but I thought, uh, I think, he says, that's not something he has particular expertise on. And he knew, you know, he knew there were, you know, debates raging within the Austrian Socialist Party, for example, between different socialist parties. And then there was this debate about Bolshevism and not Bolshevism. He said, oh, Jesus Christ. Let's, let's see whether one can find one point on which they might still agree, even though they think of the framework differently, namely how to do this economic engineering business. And let me stick with that. Whether that's a reasonable position is another question, but I think that that was his motivation. Yeah, he even says in places, you know, you know, this could be done by a dictator or by social, you yeah. know, by, you know, councils or something. You know, he 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 explicitly was thinking of it entirely kind of separate nearly from the social relations that yeah maintain it which well, is that's true and that you know people a, not, people a have, very non-marxist approach one would say well, people have exactly people have criticized them precisely for that not just marxists max max weber when uh, when when neurath was in the uh, at, at, on trial after after the munich revolution uh, max weber was one of his character witnesses you know, he basically attested to his good character, but couldn't couldn't help saying that politically the man is a bit naive <laughs> to think he could run this stuff in Bavaria of all places. Let's hit into then the criticisms, I suppose, of Neurath's ideas of calculation in kind and the socialist calculation debate and his role therein. We could maybe maybe going into that, we could we could think of. Uh, what what is what is it, what the impact of his sort of radical ideas was in the and uh, what's what I think is notable is that in a way Neurad found quite a lot of support, so to speak, a lot of grassroots support from the workers. Whenever he spoke to workers' councils, they all thought, well, that makes perfectly good sense. When he spoke in Munich to 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 the workers' council or in Chemnitz in Saxony, or kind of stuff, they were all you know very 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 supportive. But it was the political parties, both in Germany and obviously also then in in Austria, uh, who were not at all in favor of his plans. In fact, they were far more concerned with reconstructing the economy, you know, getting the economy back on its feet. They probably would have said before we do anything fancy. So it may have something to do with that, you know, the you know, news news from Russia at the time, it was nineteen nineteen, you know, frightened the horses a little bit. But 
there were there were I mean the socialization was widely discussed at the time 1919 it was all over the place Karl Korsch for example also had various socialization models and again differently more organized more oriented towards workers cooperatives also but even the the social democratic government in Berlin even initiated a socialization commission at some point which sort of said well give us a plan how we can do that they actually sat down and then first of all concentrated only on the coal industry and then made some proposals and after two years they were disbanded and nothing was <laughs> was implemented so so in other words the plans didn't didn't really go anywhere so theoretically his plans ran into ran into great opposition first of all from mises and then also from weber and once they had finished with their criticism basically neurath disappeared from discussions in economics he's not much discussed at all he turns up in a sort of cameos as if you like the antichrist in Mises's and uh, and Hayek's periodic defenses of the free market when you know there is a name of the strange man who wanted to, who wanted this crazy stuff but otherwise otherwise that's it but there's nevertheless there, there's there's too con- too concrete before one might want to go into the conceptual legacy of the whole thing there's two concrete things that are to be noted first of all as i understand it it really was neurath's proposal for total socialization for a moneyless and 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 marketless socialism that prompted the famous mises argument in the 1920 essay Calcula- economic calculation in a socialist commonwealth mises had argued obviously against socialism from you know in in, in all sorts of ways beforehand but the argument he brings in that paper which actually mentions neurath and as as opponent the argument that it's you know utterly one is condemned that without a market one is simply condemned to economic irrationality that comes first only in that paper which responds to neurath basically right so in a sense he certainly had the merit of having initiated this particular so to speak period of the socialization uh, the calculation debate namely from about 1919 onwards till to the end of the 20s by the time it moved to the anglo-american it's he was again forgotten kind of stuff and the second instance would be that after world war 2 william cop the man who who drew attention to the notion of social costs that where they were that externalities were not simply externalities we don't have to worry about but somebody actually is paying for that except not the people who draw pull in the profit cup really picked up on this on this notion of norad's notion of of substantive economic rationality which norad and weber actually actually shared and in turn made that play a role in ecological economics but that was much later after norad's death and kind of so so these are two two direct consequences of his work the problems okay mises kind of thing that writes that 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 now leads to the question well what what do we make of these neurotian ideas aren't they totally off the wall or what well they're certainly radical whether they're off the wall totally off the wall is another is another question perhaps maybe one way of maybe one way of putting it might be to say that to leave the things a little bit in a balance without prejudging things too much against norad yet is that uh, we we might perhaps say that his legacy lies in or the legacy of his economic thought i mean epistemology that's that's i'd be defend prepared to defend it to the hilt but the the uh, <laughs> economics here there is the least one can say is i think that uh, illustrate his economic ideas illustrate in a very vivid way an unresolved tension within modern thought about the economy and there one has to say that well of course norad was not the fir- very first thing to bring it under a concept namely there was max weber who talked about 
Occidental modernity, modernity in the West as a kind of golden cage, this sort of rapidly advancing industrialization accompanied by a progressive rationalization of social relations. So, but why is it a golden cage? Well, Weber doesn't immediately tell anybody. There's just this puzzling kind of phrase at the end of his, what was it in his book on, I think, the Protestant work ethic or something. But I think Neurath's concept of what we've been talking about, calculation in kind, demonstrates very strikingly the, well, let's call it the tragic bind that modernity finds itself in. Namely, that calculation in kind, the concept, represents both Neurath's advance and at the same time the vulnerability of his ideas on economic planning. 